Good morning, everyone, both on Zoom and on site. And thank you for attending the book launch for Party System Closure. My two esteemed professors who are joining us here today are very own senior professor Joel Enidi and Fernando Casal Betoa. My name is Erin Jenny, and I'm a professor of IR at CEU. I'm very honored to be monitoring, moderating such an important event for one of my dearest colleagues at CEU on this incredible achievement of theirs. I'm also sorry to not be able to attend in person um, as I came down with a bug this week. So briefly about the book. What party system closure from Oxford University Press does is to map trends in inter-party relations in Europe from 1848 to 2019. It investigates how the length of democratic experience, institutionalization of individual parties and fragmentation of parliaments and the support for anti-establishment parties shape the degree of institutionalization of party systems. The analyses address the questions about whether predictability in partisan interactions improves or undermines the quality of democracy. The development of party politics at the elite level are contrasted by the dynamics of voting behavior. The comparisons of distinct historical periods and macro regions provide a comprehensive picture of European history of party competition and cooperation. From the buzz about this book that I've been hearing, it has the marks of an indispensable resource, a book that will be assigned in courses on democracy and party politics in Europe and elsewhere, and influence scholarship in the field for many years to come. A little bit um, the slugs from the back cover. This is a fascinating and important book in which Fernando Casal Bartoa and Joel Enedi provide an original and thoughtful perspective on party system institutionalization in Europe. They persuasively disentangle the complex relations between electoral volatility, parliamentary fragmentation, polarization, and the patterns of inter-party competition and cooperation for government office. It is an extraordinary work of political science and a must read for any scholar of comparative party politics. This is Ingrid von Biesen, Professor of Comparative Politics at the University of Leiden. Another um, professor, Richard uh, Ketz, Professor of Political Science at John Hopkins University says, impressive in its scope, both temporally and geographically, this book addresses some of the most pressing issues of our time. In this era of increased polarization and the rise of anti-party system parties, it provides both significant historical and invaluable contemporary insights. It is a must read for anyone who wants to understand European party politics today or in historical perspective. I will now introduce briefly the authors before we move to the speakers who will each speak for about 10 minutes apiece, followed by a Q&A and then final remarks by Schult and Fernando. So first, Fernando Hassel Bartoy is an associate professor at the School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Nottingham in the UK. He is a co-director of Represent Research Center for the Study of Parties and Democracy, as well as a member of the OSCE ODIHR core group of political party experts. He is also an international idea collaborator and Venice Commission expert. He has published important works in the areas of party regulation, party funding, development, and party democracy promotion and is published in Journal of Politics, European Journal of EU Political Research, Sociological Methods, and Research Journal of Democracy, and other top-ranked journals. He was awarded the 2017 Gordon Smith and Vincent Wright Memorial Prize, uh, the 2017 AI, AECPA Prize for the Best Article, and the 2018 Vice Chancellor Medal of the University of Nottingham for Exceptional Achievement. Jolt Enidi is a professor of political science at CU, as well as a lead researcher for the D slash re democratization work group at the newly launched CEU Democracy Institute in Budapest. He has made seminal contributions in the fields of party of, of comparative politics, of party comparative government, church and state relations, and, part of, and political psychology with a focus on Europe. He's published in Political Psychology, European Journal of Political Research um, and Political Studies, West European Politics and other um, similar top ranked journals. He was a 2003 recipient of the Rudolf Wildemann Prize and the 2004 winner of the Bebo Award. 
We also have an all-star lineup of speakers who are all experts in party politics. We have um, Petra Gausta, who is an associate professor of democratic theory of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Charles University and is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. We also have Juan Rodriguez Turrell, professor of political science at the University of Valencia, Spain, and founding editor of Agenda Publica, a global political analysis website available in Spanish. Finally, we have Hayes Van Eyck, professor of social science research methods at the University of Nottingham, previously professor of political science. Um, and uh, Joel noted to me that his work has been a, a personal inspiration for him from the point of time that he was a graduate student. He may wanna talk about in the, that in the Q&A. So with that, um, I want to now turn the time to the speakers, beginning with Petra. If you could speak for 10 minutes or so, we could then move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Erin, for, for your kind introduction. And thank you to, uh, to the Democracy Institute and the Central European University for the, for the invitation. Uh, I would ask Erin, please give me a sign if I if I get into if I get into into rant. Uh, so what I want to what I want to say uh, briefly, I would like to make the introduction. Uh, it could be nicknamed the praise for the book. So I'm like I would like to front load that I I really love the book, and I also have to have to say I I think on this panel I I am actually not uh, an expert on political parties, but even for people who are not not experts on political parties, but who are trying to understand what is going on with democracy today, I think this is going to be a seminal book. And uh, what I would wish is that this is a profound book which takes us through, through, through Europe. And I would love, I mean, reading the book, I was in many places, I was wondering, wow, how great it would be if this would be an addition and Fernando and Jolt gave us uh, Asia and uh, especially Latin America next. So uh, if you have nothing to do, I would like uh, to read uh, a book on, uh, on Latin America and party system closure very soon. So uh, I will do a brief introduction. I want to mention some core takeaways and contribution and make a, perhaps a few remarks on government cooperation in the Czech Republic where I come from and work since the, since the great, uh, great Recession. Some points which, uh, which made me, which the book made me think about and, uh, and I would like to perhaps highlight and I have one question, one question which appeared to me from the, from the book for our, for Jolt and uh, for Fernando. So Erin already said this is, a, this is an amazing book which combines uh, empirical breadth and theoretical theoretical depth. What I in particular like is that uh, Fernando and Jolt are, are coming to, to some of the some of the basics from from party from, from party politics, going back to Peter Meyer, uh, going back to Giovanni Sartori, and taking them taking aspects of their work which has rarely so far been addressed and really applying them empirically and it's uh, it's absolutely it's absolutely amazing i was amazed also by the by their ability to, to juxtapose various parties in various historical episodes. The knowledge is absolutely, absolutely profound. I've learned uh, stuff about Czech politics I didn't, uh, I didn't know before. So congratulations, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So the authors utilize party system closure to explain party system institutionalization and the impact uh, party system closure has on both democratic survival and democratic quality. And I think this is, uh, this is really profound. Uh, today we are living in the era of autocratization and uh, it's important to, to connect the role political parties play both in, uh, in how our democracies can survive and how the quality of our democracy improves or contrary erodes. The book is full of conceptual innovations, but also uh, new measurement tools for like index for measuring the stability of the supply uh, of the supply side. I think the main thing 
to 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 take away from from the book is that cooperation among parties matters as much or perhaps in between the lines more than competition closure is about agency and autonomy at the core and the book is about the choices parties make about their coalition partners and what that means both for governance and uh, for democracy in the core takeaways just briefly uh, the the book fills many important uh, many important uh, gaps and refutes some long standing uh, beliefs i would say we had in in party politics giovanni sartori conceptualized party systems in terms of interaction among parties yet this logic was rarely taken up it's about part we need to focus as much on party system dynamics and the books provides not just knowledge but systematic knowledge of party landscape the relationship and context and all these aspects matter so you don't have to pick between but you you get uh, you get this complex uh, complex picture which helps you understand the literature mostly focuses on party competition and on the demand side politics the authors show that the relationships between parties are important the impact of coalition on wider political context there are four main sources of closure it's time institutionalization not of the party system as such but of individual political parties and there is a covariance between closure and party institutionalization they also address fragmentation and polarization some of these long standing premises they refute is that the time of democratization is not key for degree of institutionalization that under institutionalization is not the only challenge to democratic quality that over institutionalization can be as dangerous that the stability of adversarial relationship is as perilous for democracy as the lack of structure in party landscape closure is highly consequential it's sufficient condition for survival of democracy but uh, closure and democratic quality both depend on the level of economic development which is the intervening variable there especially in central and eastern europe there are pernicious consequences of high of high closure that brings me uh, that brings me to the question i would like to pose to the authors that in relationship between closure and the quality of democracy does not only time but the timing matter so i was thinking especially the, you start the book with uh, czech republic and slovakia and so i was thinking about that does early closure is early closure likely to produce weaker institutions by later closure so if the closure comes later in democratization can it uh, can it test the institution but cannot undermine them as easily so that would be that would be kind of that would be the question i have for you and if i can briefly just mention three lessons from the from the from the check case and uh, so first why should we care about the check case i think it's interesting because it offers uh, it offers us a laboratory what happens if you have permanent opposition on both sides of the political spectrum so on the left and on the <laughs> right you have political parties which are isolated by cordon sanitaire and what does it mean what does it mean for a system where you cannot build ideologically close coalition so on one hand it's pushing the democratic parties towards coalition so cooperative behavior it reduces it, it basically forces them towards the but it also forces them towards the center because you cannot build uh, ideologically uh, if if parts of the parts of the spectrum are cut off by these radical parties which are behind cordon sanitaire what it means and so i think that it uh, it imperils the let's say it prevents building ideological close ideologically close uh, close coalitions so uh, the governance the governance will be governance will be more difficult on the uh, on the on the other hand on the other hand it uh, it also um it also makes it more let's say the fragmentation further impedes policy driven governance because because you have to simply govern based on really broad uh, broad consensus what i what i think is interesting from the czech case so what we see from this past 12 years when this is happening is that the that in this constellation the junior partners play an outsized role in the bargaining process 
they favor, and it also favors office seeking over policy agendas to maximize immediate benefits because the parties don't know how long this is going to last. The second lesson from, uh, from, the, from the Czech case is that the populist style of governance presents a key contemporary challenge. Populists run on anti-establishment, populist appeal, and they highlight existing grievances promising to govern in the name of the people. But in power, they prioritize responsiveness over responsibility, which can be very difficult. Then I think there's a specific case about technocratic, uh, technocratic populists, uh, so which actually kind of bridge the left and right and kind of borrow policy solutions on both sides. Why should we care about a small country in the middle of Europe? Well, I think that the Czech model is actually, we can also see it in Germany. I mean, in other countries where you have the left <clears> and right, 15, 20% cut on left and on the right and what is happening how is it pushing the parties uh, parties together so on one hand this is what i would perhaps like to leave you with this push for cooperation but we would need to explore in the future like what kind of what kind of cooperation and how this cooperation impacts policy what i want to say is that people perhaps outside party politics in political science have for a long time loved to hate political parties and scholars of democracy in particular focused more on the importance of, of people and of agency and of civil society. And I think that what we all needed was this reminder by Fernando and Joe that parties matter for survival of democracy. So thank you. And uh, thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Petra, very much. Um, now we have Juan. So whenever you're ready. Um, yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you. First, I, will, I would like to start by thanking the invitation to be here with all this distinguished guy, uh, audience and my uh, respected colleagues to discuss about a book uh, whom I have uh, really enjoyed, but uh, because I knew part of the research that was being producing during years, during years, that has finally ended up in this wonderful book. So thank you, Zod and Fernando, for uh, letting me share some thoughts after the reading. Um, and I think it is uh, some fair, although Petra has already some very uh, good points of the book, uh, it will be fair to start by praising uh, some outstanding aspects of the research uh, done uh, in this book. I would like to remark that this is a truly piece of comparative politics, um, focusing ex ex exhaustively in one continent uh, without neglecting any of the sparse, uh, including so big states, but also micro states, all the states composing a, a big area which is uh, one of the features of the traditional all comparative politics. But it also includes, um, it also covers, or it also has a historical perspective because it covers more than one year, uh, one century and a half, uh, which forces us to think carefully about uh, the difference between, for instance, late in 19th century and nowadays. And this is something that we are not usually uh, used to in, in many in typical comparative uh, political studies. And it is also an elegant example of comparative methodology in the sense that it combines quantitative analysis with more qualitative techniques and with deep knowledge of each of these cases. Uh, so therefore, this is a book that forces us to think across countries and across time, comparatively and historically. Uh, in this sense, we are maybe not exactly in that mood of what uh, the great political scientist Alan Chaworski said, uh, analyzing cases without names. Um, we are instead uh, probably uh, working, uh, or the authors are working the way suggested by another political scientist that Petra uh, mentioned, it, Peter Mayer, uh, when he said that comparative politics allows one to be happily irresponsible uh, because we put each particularly particular country in a broad theory with universal concepts so that while the conclusions uh, um, are not necessarily true uh, for any particular country, 
um, they are nevertheless certainly true more generally for all of them together. Uh, and in this sense, I think that the book uh, located clearly in the Greek tradition of comparative politics uh, followed by the Peter Mayer, Giovanni Sartori, Jean Blondel, and many others. So let's go in now to the findings of the book. Uh, I would say that, of course, as Petra said before, uh, the book provides very important findings. I will, I will, I I will be tempted to talk about uh, the case that I know best, of course, which is Spain, which is like uh, the Czech Republic is a very interesting case for similarities, but particularly for dissimilarities with uh, the traditional past. But I will prefer in this stage of my presentation to focus on general aspects or general uh, contributions that, that I would like to remark in this, in this book. Uh, let me just to mention three. First, time is important. Uh, Petra said it before. Uh, I would like to insist in this sense because one of the main contributions of the book is to show that uh, time, not necessarily the time of birth, but the, the accumulation of democratic experience matter a lot to understand the party system dynamics. Those regimes that has come to survive after social, political, or economic turbulences are better prepared to strengthen the basis of their democratic building, making more predictable the political elite uh, behavior. Um, of course, uh, this idea suggests that the, the, the bidirectional relationship between time and party system closure should be considered. So on the one hand, the authors show that the accumulation of times of democratic experience helps to close the system. But at the same time, the authors claim that the party system closure favors democratic survival. So in this uh, respect, I'm wondering if authors consider there is a critical threshold for, of party closure that helps regimes to survive, or it is rather a particular threshold of time, uh, the book sometimes mentions 30 or 40 years, to achieve a sustainable level of closure. That, that may be uh, an issue of discussion. Second point um, I would like to remark or the second lesson I, I have taken from the book, uh, party system level and party level should be treated separately. This is one idea that founds one of the chapters, but they think this is a big idea that we should to underline. As the authors claim, we cannot blur the lines between the individual components and the total sum of them. I, I agree with it, of course, and I have been persuaded if I have, had, I have any kind of hesitation. Uh, but I agree with this in spite of the, fundamental, of the fact that the fundamental indicators employed by the authors are rooted at the party level, or more precisely, on uh, party decisions at the cabinet level. While, for instance, the indicators that you are using on party institutionalization are defined rather through aspects of party evolution at the electoral and the parliamentary arena. So I wouldn't be surprised at uh, these two uh, dimensions, uh, because of the way they are defined, uh, are not necessarily uh, evolving in parallel, or they might, might look somewhat, somewhat, uh, somewhat disconnected. But what will happen if we include the cabinet dimension in the definition of the party institutionalization, for instance, as some authors sometimes suggest when they see that entering to the government is part of the, the lifespan of a party and part of their um, own institutionalization. Um, and now, um, uh, getting a bit farther from the topic of the book, this distinction between the party level and the party system level, the need to distinguish them, uh, um, make me thought about a more general uh, idea about political science. And why political science has not come to assume a, dis a substantial distinction between micro and, mi and micro uh, politics. For instance, in the same way that uh, economists are doing with micro, uh, macro economics and micro politics, Political science do, do, don't really, doesn't really distinguish 
and doesn't make this distinctive point. And I think this book make, make us think about this, the importance of, think, of looking at different perspectives that should be treated more separately than many uh, comparative studies uh, do. And finally, a third point that I would like to raise, uh, dealing with some probably the, the most important contribution in theoretical terms, is that there seems to be a route to party system closure that is defined with this um, uh, chain, explanatory chain connecting different aspects driving towards party closure. I think this is uh, the, one of the latest uh, chapters when they bring all, all, all the previous analysis together and then they try to define this explanatory change connecting in order to better understand uh, how democratic regimes can drive towards more uh, closed party systems or toward more open party systems. Um, I think this is a parsimonious explanation of how party systems may evolve after democratic transitions or may evolve also after crisis of satisfaction with democracy as we probably saw during the Great Recession. However, I'm wondering to what extent some of the internal points of this change, party institutionalization, concentration, anti-party system decline, are not actually uh, working simultaneously. Because uh, when I think this distinction made in one of the, of the chapters, in theoretical terms, I see it very clearly, but when I have to think this, uh, this chain in practice, it's for me very difficult not to observe that these uh, dimensions usually come um, simultaneously. Okay. Um, I have also some, well, not criticism, but, uh, but uh, some reflections, but I think that I will, lead, uh, I will prefer to let it here in order to have, have more time for discussion later if we have place. I will, I will then just finish by saying that uh, this wonderful books makes one of these very difficult tasks, which is taking what we have learned from previous giants of our discipline, like it was the case of Peter Mayer, that create this great concept that I have. I myself uh, use it in, in some of my articles on par uh, open party systems and closed party systems. But that was a concept that was not clearly defined. And these people has produce a research that helps really to make a more empirical, uh, produce more empirical sense for this big concept. So now political science has made a clear advance in order to clarify uh, this important aspect of party systems and party elites in democratic regimes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. And finally, we have Professor Van der Eyck. Thank you, Aaron. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, being invited to this uh, pleasant occasion where we can celebrate uh, the appearance of a, uh, as I will explain, great book. Um, secondly, my apologies uh, for not being able to be physically present in Budapest, uh, but uh, unfortunately, many of us uh, are uh, having to cope with uh, similar kind of restrictions at the moment, which were not there two years ago or something like that. So I think the first thing that's in order is a big expression of congratulations to the authors. It is no little thing. Uh, to write a book that is uh, coherent, important, that brings new insights. Uh, and it looks, as soon as it's there on the table, as it's shown there in front of Juan and Schult, uh, it looks so self-evident. Okay, there's a book. What else? We have a case full of books. No, it's not like that. It is a hell of a lot of work, I can assure the audience. It's a hell of a lot of work to put something like this together uh, and even more uh, uh, work to put something together that I think uh, correctly has been uh, uh, referred to by the previous speakers as an important book, as a seminal book, as a book that deserves to be on the desk of everyone uh, who studies party systems, government formation and the evolution of democracy and its stability. So I'd like to congratulate the authors on, uh, on this major achievement. 
Uh, and I hope they will find, uh, in spite of the fact that they are now not at the same location, that they will find many opportunities to savor together uh, this accomplishment. Why is this an important book? Uh, well, I think there are at least three reasons. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, one, one could list more, but I think the three most important reasons, and this is not in one particular order, but you know, once we talk, we have to mention something first, but it is not first. You know? It's just the one I start with. It's at the level of conceptualization. Uh, this book does more for conceptualizing uh, the important terms uh, in, in, in which we try to grasp what's going on at the level of party systems uh, than uh, much of the literature has been done. Uh, it points out uh, limitations of <clears throat> more informal conceptualizations that are abound in the literature uh, and it tries to um, uh, replace that and to, to complement that uh, with uh, much more elaborate uh, reasonings for the conceptus for the concept that they uh, formulate and try to then subsequently uh, leave those concepts not as abstract notions but as living things as things that can be measured that can be represented in data and therefore can be used in uh, in empirical analysis so i think the conceptual level is is very important equally important but of a different uh, but related of course uh, nature is the effort uh, that has gone into making concepts observed the production of data, the production of data sources, uh, uh, the systematization of them um, across a scope which is unique in breadth. Um, uh, Juan already uh, <coughs> referred to the fact that this is not just about Europe, it's about all European democratic systems, including microstates. It is not about, say, the period <coughs> after World War II, it is from 1848 onwards. Uh, this is uh, unprecedented in scope, um, and it pays off, as we see in uh, various chapters of the book, because uh, this unique wide scope data collection allows the authors not only to look at party systems that are in existence but also party systems that have failed and that are out of existence that are uh, from the past and the inclusion of information about failed or past systems which are not longer with us gives not only a different twist uh, on their analytical results, but also leads to different findings, findings that we otherwise wouldn't have found when we only look at those <coughs> systems that have survived. So I think this is uh, something very important. Uh, and I would uh, 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 like to commend the authors uh, for all of that. And the third thing for which this is a great book is because all these kind of conceptualizations, measurements, data operationalizations and whatever <coughs> are not being presented just for their own sake. They are being used in testing theories, in probing uh, uh, empirical ideas, uh, and it all culminates in the, the last, basically the last two chapters, I think chapters 11 and 12 of the book, uh, no, 10 and 11, um, in which uh, they bring a whole series of different phenomena together on the in the first of these chapters to try to explain uh, and, and identify the various kinds of factors that impinge on the development of closure. What affects closure? What makes closure happen? Or on the contrary, what, make, what undermines closure and developments towards closure? Um, and this is not just a matter of looking at one thing. This is looking at a whole host of uh, factors which are in that respect brought together into a single model uh, in a uh, set of elegant analyses. So um, that's the one. And then they continue in chapter 12 with looking not at what affects closure, 
but at what is affected by closure. And they look particularly at democracy and survival uh, and quality of democracy. Um, so together, these three aspects, uh, the use of their concepts and data, the provision of new data on a scale unprecedented, and uh, a, a rigor of conceptualization so far not yet seen in this field, I think together uh, merit uh, this to be uh, mentioned as a great, important, and probably seminal book. So um, this is not the time to point out shortcomings. There are, of course, shortcomings. Uh, no, of course. This is, I mean, uh, after all, uh, we've been thrown out of paradise and that, that holds for Fernando and Schultz as well as for all of us. Um, but uh, overall, this is, a, this is a great book. Now, there are a few things which I would like to uh, uh, bring up with respect uh, to all of this, which are uh, some, some, well, what shall I say? Questions, points of interest on my side. Um, so, uh, in terms of conceptualization the, uh, conceptualization, the authors not only bring up uh, the, the, the concept of closure and they elaborate that, but they also bring into the discussion and make good use of that, the concept of blocks. Um, and uh, blocks are um, uh, important and basically are defined by parties or groups of parties uh, that uh, 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 <clears throat> are seen as and that behave uh, as as close together uh, as almost natural allies um, now this is an important notion um, and they apply it throughout the book at, at, at various places where it is a little bit lacking i think the application of this is in their uh, uh, in their chapters where they talk not only about the supply side, which is closure and, and party behavior, but where they also talk about the demand side, which is reflected in the concept of volatility. So the demand side has to do uh, with, uh, uh, if you want to call it that way, relationships between parties in terms of popular support uh, as expressed uh, in electoral outcomes. Um, they use their the Paterson Index, uh, and I can imagine very well uh, why they do so, uh, because that is well known, it is uh, well established in literature, yeah. and there are lots of uh, 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 results already uh, published. However, in the Paterson Index, this whole notion of blocks is entirely ignored. And we know very well, if we look uh, at uh, periods uh, from which we have much more rich data than 1848, um, that uh, a lot of volatility is, is derived from what's sometimes referred to as a revolving door between the various members of a single block. So that actually uh, volatility looks very high, whereas it revolves around a very small space uh, between parties who often ideologically and programmatically are not very far apart. Now, if that's the case, uh, then uh, I would have liked to see, and of course you cannot go back to 1848, but some kind of speculation maybe, or some kind of more uh, short-term uh, exploration as to why this block notion would give us a different perspective on volatility and therefore also on the relationship between volatility and, um, and closure. Because you demonstrate very well that with the existing measure of uh, volatility and your developed measure of closure, these two do not do the same thing when we look in relationship to other variables. But is that perhaps because this block aspect uh, of party relationships has been ignored there? So, um, of course, I, I, this is not the place to answer that. Uh, but I think it, I would like to put it on the table as something that has to be uh, uh, pursued uh, in further research. And of course, in many other places, the book also is a rich source of inspiration for uh, further uh, research. I'd like to end this short contribution with a question. Uh, 
And again, uh, this this addresses something similar than what uh, as what was um, uh, brought to the table by Juan, uh, namely these what what you call uh, royal uh, roads to closure, um, royal routes to closure, and you you elaborate them for uh, yeah. a, a number of countries. And they exist of kind of a sequence of events and processes that uh, once you follow that sequence, at the end of it, uh, we reach a high level and hopefully a sustainable level, but we don't know that, of closure. Now, closure is important, but closure is not permanent. So closure <laughs> may be undermined, may be diminished, uh, may collapse, as we also see uh, in a historical perspective. Now, this royal route to closure, what is the royal route to disclosure, if you want to call it that way, to the undermining? Is that the reverse? Or are there other, I would expect not, or are there other elements or maybe other sequences that uh, kind of describe the road from high closure to much less predictable and much less dependable uh, ways of uh, uh, inter-party relationships. Um, and maybe uh, the authors would have some time to speculate about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Case. We now turn to Juan, I believe, who will be moderating the Q&A slash contributions, responses from the authors. I know we have a limited amount of time, so it's really up to the authors how they want to use the rest of it. Um, perhaps Fernando could start. I, I would be the second who reacts, and then we will see whether we have time for questions. Well, then I will be briefly, because I'm really interested in reactions from, from the audience. Uh, well, uh, what can I say after these three giants of political science talking so many nice things and hiding all the problems and, you know, uh, mistakes that uh, a work like that, even if, uh, you know, we have reread the book at the end uh, many, many times. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, uh, the, the many, many problems can be still found. Uh, I'm very, I'm very happy to, to, to hear that, you know, um, they think that this can be, you know, a, a great contribution to the, to the, uh, you know, uh, field. Uh, to be honest, you know, when I joined the European University Institute, uh, you know, I always, you know, saw these great scholars that, that were there and, and I was just, you know, uh, like a child dreaming to, to, to write a, a, a book that, of course, will never compare to their work, but, you know, could go on the path of, you know, making a, a little mark in the field <laughs> of, of political science and, and, and to hear, you know, from these three great scholars that we have uh, today with us, you know, that this could be, you know, the beginning, you know, it is uh, really, really nice. Uh, regarding, you know, some of the, some of the issues that were pointed out, uh, I must confess that, you know, I mean, uh, Petra, you know, Juan, Case, Wow, you know, I think I have, uh, and Schult, you know, I am sure agrees with me, you know, we have an agenda for, for research for the next, you know, uh, uh, seven years, which took, you know, to write uh, this book, right? So, you know, I mean, the, the, the question about, uh, for example, you know, the equifinality in terms of the royal route, you know, uh, to, to closure. Uh, I think that, you know, for example, you know, uh, Cousier would have been applied in order to see if, you know, the path towards closure and towards disclosure, you know, are different, for example, you know. Uh, uh, in the book, um, we, 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 we have, uh, we use process tracing, you know, and we use just, you know, one case uh, uh, study. And to be honest, you know, after seeing the uh, last German elections, I think, you know, that our, you know, royal route to, you know, party system change and that we deal in the book on Germany clearly showed that, you know, the next, you know, government is going to have, you know, an innovative formula. It will consist of partial alternation. And it was close to be open access because the link didn't make it, you know, uh, to, to, to have enough weight to have a red, red, you know, green uh, coalition. But if not, you know, we would be almost 100 percent sure. And in this sense, you know, I think that Juan's point 
you know, is extremely interesting on this royal route uh, to closure. And, and to be honest, you know, we, we, we see, and, and perhaps we should have, uh, now that I think about it, we should have pointed it uh, out and we don't do in the book. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, uh, this mechanism uh, takes, you know, step by step, but at the end, it's like, you know, in a, it becomes, you know, so it, it is like a marathon, right? Where you have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, be uh, um, me measuring your forces. You know, so at the beginning, you know, you put one step, you know, which is, you know, I mean, democratic, uh, you know, uh, uh, the consolidation, then, you know, you you have the second step, which is, you know, new parties are starting to appear, the traditional parties start to split. The third one, you know, is, you know, fragmentation starts to, to, to increase and then, you know, the stream parties become stronger, but there is a sprint at the end. And in fact, you know, this is something that, for example, when you think of the last elections in Germany, you have almost everything happening at the same time, giving us a signal of what happened in these elections, right? And I would say that, you know, this can be also, you know, Juan knows the Spanish case uh, well, right? I mean, the last November 2019 elections was the explosion, but, you know, these things was, you know, to use a, a, a cooking metaphor, had been, you know, boiling already, you know, at least since 2015. So, and this is something that certainly, you know, we, we perhaps fail to, to, to talk about, you know, in the, in the book. And there is also, of course, you know, what, what Case mentioned about, you know, block volatility. I mean, being, you know, having Peter Mayer as a, uh, our, you know, mentor and supervisor, you know, is something that we have had in our minds. Uh, and of course, you know, the problem, as you mentioned, Case, is that, you know, going back to 1848 with blocks is a bit, uh, you know, in terms of volatility calculations, is quite uh, complicated, but it's something that certainly, you know, should, could be done, you know, in the future. And we have written a couple of papers on, on, on that. But, you know, uh, we need, you know, as, as you always told me, Case, when we talk here at, at Nottingham, you know, we need to stop at some, at some point. But, you know, certainly something that, you know, should be, should be considered. Uh, I'm very happy that everybody appreciates, you know, the inclusion of microstates because uh, my dear co-author, you know, always thought that these states don't exist. It's a bit like, I don't know, uh, Slavic Holstein or Teruel, you know, they don't exist. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm very happy that, you know, this is really, really appreciated. Uh, I can assure you that they have been in every single of them in their parliaments and their libraries. You know, it was complicated to get some data, uh, you know, uh, uh, and for some variables. You cannot imagine how difficult it is. But, uh, you know, I'm happy that this is appreciated. And then, you know, to, to leave, of course, you know, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, important questions to, to show who is the really mastermind behind the book. Uh, I would like to, to say to Petra two things. The first thing is that, you know, uh, uh, hopefully your wishes will become true. Uh, if you go to whogovernsasia.com, you will have, you know, what we have started as a new data set on, you know, part systems in Asia. Hopefully it will be, you know, a continuation. So it would be hopefully like the Godfather 2, better than the Godfather 1. So let's see how, mm -hmm. how, how things go. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to fulfill your wishes on, on that side. Although, you know, perhaps Juan, you know, would like to also contribute at some point with the Latin American uh, side, uh, you know, in the, in the future. I also would like to say that, you know, I mean, the question that you're posing on, you know, is early closure, you know, bad and, and, and closure that comes later in democratization? Well, this is something that, you know, we, we only implicitly answered in the book. If you think, for example, at uh, Spain, Greece, Hungary, Czech Republic, Georgia, Montenegro, these were countries that became closed very, very fast, right? And, and when we think about the quality of democracy in these countries, well, it is lacking, you know. If you think, for example, about Nordic countries, you think about Luxembourg, Iceland, UK, Germany, France, closure took, you know, step by step. You think about Germany, you know, it only really closes, you know, in the second half of the 60s, right? So, and, you know, and you see that the quality of, so perhaps there is something there, there is something that, you know, we could, we could explore. And finally, you know, we are very happy that you like that we start the book with, 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 the, Czech, uh, with the Czech Republic. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, here we follow, you know, the advice of our great friend and colleague, Kevin Degan Krause, you know, I mean, Czechoslovakia is everywhere. And in fact, you know, it was a great model, you know, that was 
you know, later transport, trans, transplanted, you know, for example, to the Weimar Republic or others. So Czechoslovakia was a, as a case of success in contrast to, to others. So, you know, as he always says, you know, Czechoslovakia is everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to all. And then let me also thank you very much for these uh, gracious uh, words, and we will take them with, with a grain of salt. Um, and also thanks for, for uh, some very pertinent uh, uh, criticism. So let me start with uh, Petra's. I uh, think she's absolutely right that while we are looking at the relationship between closure and uh, democracy, and we look at the dynamics of closure, but we don't look at the relationship between dynamics of closure and democracy. So we don't look at uh, the timing of closure, and this is something that we could uh, uh, very well do. She's also right that uh, there is a lot of room to explore different sorts of cooperation. So we could go uh, deeper into whether the cooperation is across the aisle, wh what the aisle is in different contexts. That already uh, takes me to some extent to this block issue. Um, but before that, uh, let me re react to Juan's point that uh, we could uh, develop further the model by identifying the critical uh, thresholds, both on the side of closure and uh, uh, time. And we also um, could uh, play with alternative operationalizations of party institutionalization, because now, indeed, we try to have as different indicators for the two levels as possible. And of course, had we had indicators that would bring um, the two together uh, somewhat uh, more uh, uh, closely, probably the pattern would have been different. So one would need to go back to these indicators and to think about which are more valid and whether our results are driven uh, by our oper operationalization or there is some intrinsic relationship between these uh, phenomena. Also, uh, the sequence of factor, the chain, is a um, difficult issue. It, 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 to some extent, this is a, a, a speculative part of the book. We have some, uh, as, as uh, Fernando mentioned, uh, some uh, cases behind uh, that, that support that, that, that chain, but there's a lot of um, hypothetical uh, conjuncture uh, done there that um, would need to be examined and uh, uh, case is absolutely right that um, we don't pay as much attention to openness as to closure as an outcome which is i think often done that is even though these concepts are symmetric in principle very often uh, scholars focus on one end and they forget uh, or, or they don't take the other end as seriously as 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 the positive end. So, so the negative is, is somewhat neglected. And he's also right that uh, the uh, demand side uh, volatility uh, could be measured in terms of blocks, and that would fit, in a way, the philosophy of the book much better than the Pedersen Index. Um, here, uh, one would need to answer, of course, uh, what are the blocks more clearly and, and, and whether uh, there is enough degree of comparability? Those scholars who, let's say, compare left to right, and by left they mean working class parties and they study, let's say, the 1960s and 70s, they have an easy time. Because at that time there was a relatively clear uh, cleavage between these two blocks. Whenever you move out of that comfort zone and different time periods, different regions of uh, Europe and so on, suddenly it becomes much more complicated, but um, yeah, it, it needs to be done. And, and finally, maybe I just close this. Uh, uh, um, well, Erin mentioned that um, and the example of case uh, inspired me. Actually, it's much more than that. I wouldn't be here uh, without him. So I would do a different uh, profession, a different um, occupation had I not been exposed to his class. I think we're running up against the end of the seminar time. Is that right? Or is there time? Um, well, uh, colleagues here are, are nodding. So apparently, we do need to uh, finish here, if I understand well. We, we, well, um, maybe one question. So what, what they indicate that I, I, we should open the floor for one question. So. It's uh, uh, quite a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of uh, anybody asking or commenting. Yes, please. Thank you. 
I wonder if there is any uh, outlook to scales. Because closure is a relational phenomenon. The, these parties ally and then get into a, a block. I wonder if you consider scales, uh, apart from the national level, going down to local, regional, and going up to maybe a possible future of a transnational European party system. Well, I'm sure Fernando uh, thought about this because he often thinks in these multi-level uh, um, models. Um, for me, uh, the application of this conceptual apparatus to other level um, would be a little bit of a risky enterprise because everything, uh, I mean, all the literature we know, everything is about the national level and the stakes uh, are very different at regional level, local level, and, and um, well, at a supranational level. But perhaps it is something that we could uh, pursue it would be interesting, actually, to compare the different levels exactly uh, along these lines. That is, is it so that because the stakes are different, therefore, let's say, the, the type of cooperations, the, the pressure to, uh, towards coalescing uh, is larger or smaller, uh, depending on the level? Fernando? Oh, of course, you know, I mean, uh, you, you are right <laughs> in reading my mind. And in fact, Juan might remember, you know, our conversations, you know, a couple of years ago, and we were trying to put together this uh, question for, for Spain. But, you know, later, you know, unfortunately, our agendas, you know, just, you know, diverge a bit. But, you know, perhaps, Juan, we should come back to, to, to this issue now that the book is out and the, and the concept and the index, you know, are, are out and perhaps, you know, uh, you know, try to, to apply. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question that seems to, 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 to show that there is some, some you know, uh, lacuna in the literature that we could uh, explore. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank the authors, Fernando and Jolt, for providing such a wonderful resource to comparativists and for sharing their work with us. Thanks also to the speakers, Petra, Fernando, and I'm sorry, uh, Juan and Kate, for offering such interesting insights on their work and to the audience, both on Zoom and CEU in Vienna and Budapest.